got you guys doing all kinds of different things today. I'm sorry. But here, uh, I'm going to read the word, and I'm going to pray and do announcements. The word today is coming from Luke 13, verses 1 or 9, and it's titled, Repent or Perish. That's what it's entitled. It says, Now at the same time, there were some present who were reporting to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you think that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered these things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you think that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse offenders than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he was telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, and I, until I dig around it and put in manure. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. That is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you so much for bearing with me. All right. Now, today is Palm Sunday, okay? But I don't have a Palm Sunday passage set up here. I've got a Luke passage set up. But, of course, I did bring a Palm Sunday passage to read, okay? Because we have to remember this and honor this and remember the Lord. That's a good tradition right there, things, okay? So I'm going to put you on the beginning picture here, though. And then I'm going to... But before I get started with this, I'm going to do some announcements. Like I said, I'm backwards today. <laughs> Hope I don't stay backwards the rest of the year now. <laughs> All right, but here's the thing is, is we have some announcements. Is this week is, uh, is what a lot of folks call Holy Week, because it's the week that we celebrate that Jesus went to the cross, and this is Palm Sunday. And, uh, but we don't have a Good Friday service or anything like that, but we do have a Thursday night Bible study. And that Thursday night Bible study is, uh, I'm going to see what I'm going to do, it, but it may be on Jeremiah 24, 25, maybe centered right around uh, uh, the, the Last Supper right there. We may center in on that this Thursday at Bible study. So I think that might be really interesting to dig deep with that right in our Bible study and then have a little communion with one another right there on Thursday night. So, But that'll be 6.30, 6.30 to 8-ish, ish, we go to 8.30. But it's 6.30 to 8, all right? But we'll try to go down toward 8. But uh, that's what we have going on. My wife has a Bible study on Tuesday, as long as she's feeling better. But she lets the ladies know real well. But that'll be at, I believe, at 6 is when the ladies are meeting now. Or they're meeting at 6.30. 6 they're meeting now. So 6 p.m. on Tuesday. And and then uh, we're getting ready for next Sunday, which should be we should be Resurrection Sunday, and we'll be I'll be preaching on Resurrection Sunday. Okay, so, so you won't have Luke next week. We may have a passage from Luke, but it'll be far ahead. I don't know, probably not a passage from Luke, because that'll be strange, because then we'll be the same passage again before long. But uh, but you have a passage, one of the Gospels on the resurrection, that's what we do. And, and they say that the, there's like four times a year that people will really come to church, and uh, Resurrection Sunday is really one of those times right there. People feel like it's something they should do as a human being is go to church. So ask somebody. Try to make it a point this week. Try to think, i got one assignment from my church this week. It's just to ask somebody, would you like to come worship in my church this Sunday for Resurrection Sunday? We call it Easter Sunday. Tell them that because that way they'll know it better or something. Maybe. We like to word, use the word resurrection better though. But, uh, but ask them. And you know, I'll tell you, you'll be surprised at how many people, if you just ask me, they'll come to church. If they don't come, it's okay. It's all right, but at least you know you did your part and you tried. So ask next week. Ask somebody, say, hey, would you like to go celebrate the Lord with me on Resurrection Sunday? This Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Come on in at 10 a.m., okay? So this would be good. And then I know the ladies all, the ladies who signed up for an event, they're going to Ken Ham's Creation Museum for a ladies' conference next Sunday sometime after church. So that would be something too, an exciting, exciting trip. Potluck's not next Sunday, though. It's the following Sunday. Two weeks potluck. 
At times we've had folks bring potluck a week early, but we don't want that to happen because we don't want to mess you up. So not next Sunday, but the Sunday afterward. But we will take communion next Sunday as well. Something I was telling you, this quick side note, you know I love that guy John Bunyan so much for Pilgrim Progress. He had a lot of persecution against him from all the other Baptists in his day because he practiced open communion. Open communion in the sense that people get to judge for themselves whether to take the communion or not. Man, he got it hard right there. But that is how we practice too. You went into, we all say open in the sense that we think non-believers should take it because we say you should judge yourself. But other folks, we call us open and that we don't judge you and stop you from taking it or not. But uh, we will have communion Sunday next week too. So it's a special time as well. So, so it'll be a good Sunday. But so this is a good Sunday as well too. This is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it as well. All right, so those are my announcements. Did I miss any announcements? All right, I don't think I missed any. All right, so here, I took a picture of your last chance. Look, look at this. Look at this up here. Oh, oh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Jason. I got the directory growing, going, and you need to sign up back there and put your information on it, and we're going to print out a directory and give it to everybody that would like to have it in our church. So it'll be real nice to get a little refreshed directory. A lot of people have asked. And we're making sure that happens. So it's well in progress right now, but we have a lot of empty holes. So, so if I can remember, when I finish preaching today, I'm going to stand at the door with it too. And I'm going to be like, hey, your name on here? And if for some reason you don't feel comfortable with putting your name on, you just say, I don't want to. So I'll say, okay, I won't twist your arm. I, I, I believe me. But, but I think most people would want it on there because it's nice to be able to connect with each other talk with each other, love one another. We all need somebody to lean on. Every one of us needs somebody to lean on. And that's nice to be able to connect and talk to each other, even outside the church, do life together. That's what's so special about a little small church like this, is we can really do life with one another. We can text each other. We can call each other. We can hang out with each other. We can do stuff together. It's good. It's beautiful. I mean, this is so wonderful. We don't want to waste our lives and miss out on our good opportunity of being that family for one another. So here, I'll get back here. Many of you have taken a road trip, okay? Some of you ladies will be taking a road trip down to the Creation Museum in just a week, right? And you see signs. And, and sometimes you see biblical signs. Let me tell you, if I owned some farmland, I'd have a big biblical sign on my farmland. You know I would. You know, these ones that say, you know, believe in Jesus, you know, uh, heaven or hell. They say signs. I would have a big sign up there. I sure would. I would build it with the fellas. I'd get a bunch of two by fours and I'd make my own huge sign. I'd put some of those solar lights on there so at nighttime, at least till midnight, it would shine and people driving by could see something that proclaims the Lord Jesus Christ in my yard, right? But just imagine you're driving on the road and you see a sign like this that says, Your last chance. If you think about things, if you've ever driven out west, I used to drive in uh, New Mexico. I went to New Mexico one time down to Taos, from Colorado. And when I went there, I remember seeing things like your last chance for gas. And I've driven through Texas, too. And in Texas, you'll see these signs. And you better take heed, because it could literally be 100-plus miles until the next gas station. There is nothing out there. It's empty, all right? And this is kind of like that for this sermon that Jesus was preaching. If you've been following in Luke and all the stuff we've been talking about, and it all really does go together, but we don't want to have a sermon that's like five hours long, so we're making these shorter sermons <laughs> that go together. But uh, it really is your last chance right here, right now, to repent and to believe, okay? None of us know how long we've got. Every single day we could think, this is my last chance, because it's the day that we live, and none of us live in tomorrow. We all live right here today. And I wrote on the side here, Sometimes death and destruction are caused by human beings. Military aggression, religious persecution, violence in the city streets. Other times a disaster has a natural cause, a tornado, an earthquake, a tsunami, disease. But whatever the cause, people ask the same questions. Who is to blame and why didn't God do something to stop it? I hear this all the time. Maybe you ask this yourself. I hope that most of you going to church right here now with me. This isn't a hang-up for you, because it's probably not because you're here at church, okay? But you don't know how many people I run into don't go to church anymore because of this exact question right here. Why didn't God do something to stop it, 
right? So we're going to get into that today. And another brief pause, intermission here, and how we're doing things different than usual, is I would feel it would be injustice if we don't at least do a reading of a Palm Sunday reading, because it is Palm Sunday, okay? And I picked the book of Luke, which we will one day preach this passage, all right? I don't know how long it's going to be, but watch, it's probably going to be around Christmas time. It's, it's where this is going to fall, all right? But it won't be right at Christmas. We go a different path for four weeks, but it could be in November. So let me read it. It's Luke 19, 28 to 40, in case you don't have really good eyes. And after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it happened that when he approached Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount called of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, and saying, Go into the village ahead of you, in which as you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which no one yet has ever sat, and untie it, and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, Because the Lord has need of it. So when those who were sent departed, they found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colts? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And after they threw their garments on the colt, they put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their garments on the road. Now as soon as he was approaching, near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God, rejoicing with a loud voice for the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones will cry out. And that was the entry of our Lord before his death on the cross. And it was prophesied as well in the Old Testament. And in, in, uh, in, in Micah 5.2, it said that Jesus would come in riding on a donkey. That's how the Messiah would arrive. And that was like... 500 years prior written, and here's Jesus arriving in the exact same way. And if you look through all the rest of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, they all have a triumphant entry passage, and some of them, besides the garments they're thrown down, they're throwing down palm branches, okay? And that was like for a sign of royalty. He was royalty coming in. And think about this. You may not think much about taking your shirt off or your coat off and laying it down because you've got another one. But, but most people back then didn't have another one. So imagine putting your coat, your best coat down, your only coat down for a donkey to walk on it in the dirt. And we know what donkeys do sometimes. All right? If you talk about exhaust from a car, there's exhaust that comes out of animals as well too, right? Not quite exhaust. But think about that. And people were praising Jesus and there was maybe two million people in the area. Now, the way it sounds to me, Israel's real small, it's so tight. So I can just imagine, you couldn't see anywhere but people's faces and people everywhere as he approached and came in. It would have been a huge deal. Why were there so many? Because it was the week of the Passover and everybody from all the Jews from all around could only sacrifice at the temple. So they'd all come for this holy time of the year for Passover. And they were there and they were worshiping Jesus. And unfortunately... From what we gather, from how we read the scriptures, they were looking for a Messiah that would be a military king. And since he did come as a military king, these same people, many of them are in the crowd yelling, crucify him. Only five or six days later is what we're going to see right, when you read the Bible. And that just shows that human sinful nature, just how bad it is. Even Jason, when he talks about Nehemiah, how joyful and wonderful the people were so happy when they heard the word. But he, he let us know it's coming time where they're going to have to get reproved because they're going to go back in their sinful ways and things. It's that sinful nature, that, that, that old, old man's sin that we need, to, we need to try to destroy on a daily basis and be a brand new living creature of Jesus Christ and not be an old slave to sin. But these, this is what was going on, and Jesus indeed is the king, and, uh, and this is what he did, was he came in to Jerusalem, and there wasn't anything that was going to stop Jesus from coming into Jerusalem, nothing. People tried to stop him, even his right-hand man, Peter, tried to stop him, and he told him, Satan, get behind me. He would not let anything stop him from coming to do what he was born to do, to come and die and pay the price for our sins. 
And it's a beautiful message for Resurrection Sunday that uh, Jesus is coming to pay the price for our sins. Now I'm back. Man, I need your attention today. Because you're like, whoa. We're all over the place here today, okay? I'm sorry about this. All right, so now we're back in the beaten, normal groove of things, all right? This is my groove. This is where I'm most comfortable. This is my, this is my territory going verse by verse. So here we are, 13.1. Now at the same time, there were some present who were reporting to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So this is, a, this is a terrible type of thing that would have happened. Let me read this, what I have up there. While they were engaged in this religious act of worship to the one true God, the Galileans were viciously murdered by soldiers under the governance of Pontius Pilate, the Roman ruler of Judea. It would be as if terrorists came into a church and shot worshipers as they were partaking of communion, then mingled their blood with the communion wine. A guy named Art Lindsay said that last quote right there. And that's really what it would have been like. It would have been like some crazy came in here and shot us, and then we were about to take communion and started making weird mixtures or something like this, okay? This would be about the same thing that would happen. And, and, they, and, they're, and remember the last stuff that Jesus talked about. Jesus was hitting them hard last week, okay, when I preached last week. He was hitting them hard, okay, to repent, to believe, to turn to him, or, or, or you're going to get to make a deal with the judge. Remember that I said to make a deal with the judge before the last time comes, because once you get put in the prison, you're never ever going to get out of the prison, okay? Talking about like end time, talking about hell. And now all of a sudden, it's almost like these guys are trying to antagonize Jesus and try to get, well, what if, what about? And they're trying to poke holes in Jesus right here. And we can see that Jesus doesn't let any holes get poked in him because he, you know, he knows what they're thinking. He knows everything. He's, he's genius. He's God himself. So we're going to see how this plays out right here. So, so, they, so they let him know. And this was like some recent news. Let's talk about, think about this. You know, I just read you, uh, what, Luke, Luke 23 or something? Uh, Luke 22 about the, uh, about the Passover? This isn't but maybe a year or two years, maybe less than that, from when Jesus is going to go through, and they're going to scream at Pontius Pilate, we want Jesus, we don't want the other guy, and then when he calls Jesus the king, he says, we have no king but Caesar. These same fellows who were so mistreated by these bad guys, who were the people who were oppressing them and in their country, ruling over them, they chose them over their own Messiah, Jesus Christ, that God gave them. Talk about how bad, sinful human nature could be. I mean, we can't even hardly imagine something like that going on. But that, that's, that's what happened. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you think that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered these things? So Jesus points this out to them. And that they wrongly assumed the victims were to blame. Okay, Bad things happen to bad people. That's bad theology. If you think that, get it out of your mind right here and right now, okay? That is a terrible way to think. Here's a way to think about it just happened this weekend. If you watch the news, poor Russia, I think it's 133 dead from some terrorist uh, shooting, like in some type of uh, opera-looking place or something like it looked to me, some type of a theater. They killed 133 people and wounded a lot more. These ISIS, Islamic State terrorists right there, okay? That's a horrible, terrible thing. And perhaps some people in the world think, well, look what Russia's been doing to Ukraine. You know, it's God getting them for it. I don't think that at all, okay? In fact, if you think about it, who would have been the people of some theater thing would have probably been people like us, okay? People probably even less militant style, okay? Because I bet they didn't choose a place where some guy could have run out and grabbed him and punched him and taken the weapon from him. It was probably a bunch of elderly folks enjoying a wonderful concert and all of a sudden these crazies just start killing everybody and it's not a thing that it's because those guys are more bad than the other fellas and it happened there and didn't happen in america or somewhere else and you think about that when you think about this happening bad theology bad people bad theology think about 9 11. do any of us think those poor people the 3,000 people in those towers were worse than anybody else no in fact we feel bad for them we think this so sad that that happened to them and for their families and everybody else that's how we should think about these kind of things when they go on it shouldn't be like bad things happen to bad people that's not good theology at all and jesus is pointing this out and he says to them do you think that they were greater sinners than everybody else that was around here why do you think they died like that 
Was it because they were bigger sinners? In Job 4, 7, his friends thought that he was a bigger sinner, and that's why all this stuff happened to him. And that was bad theology, what his friends thought. Because we had the beginning of Job, where God called Job the most righteous man on the earth. I mean, he was, he was the greatest man in the East, and God calls him righteous twice. Or in John 9, 2, when the disciples themselves, they thought that uh, the blind man was blind because what did he do? What did he do? What did his parents do to make him deserve to be blind? And Jesus said, the only reason he was like this was so I could be glorified. And I think, if I'm right, he was like 38 years old. Can you imagine 38 years of life you go through suffering, being blind, for one thing, for the glory of God. That is intense and it's big, and it's much bigger than most people's picture of God is inside their minds. But our picture of God should always be bigger, 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 never smaller, okay? And we can think about that with what, how Jesus hit with these guys right here. And sometimes people do suffer the consequences for their own actions. That for sure happens. If you smoke all of your life, most people are going to get a uh, going to get COPD. I, I see it all the time. In fact, I've met a lot of people here. As you're getting older, you know a lot of people COPD. And if you ask them what happened, they're like, "Well, I smoked for decades of my life." Okay, how did that happen? Probably because they smoked for decades of their life. Now, sometimes people get COPD they never smoke. Sometimes people smoke till 102 years old and they're still smoking. They don't get it. But that's the rarity, okay? For the most of the time, when we see people do things of their own actions, sometimes we see consequences come up. I'm a younger fella. I don't know, younger. I'm like right in the middle, right? I'm 5-0. 5-0 is where I am. Oh, here I'm 5-0. And in 5-0, I know a lot of people my age from the military, guys who used to be my good pals, have got liver cancer now, or they've got cirrhosis, or they're going through some horrible issues because they've always been drinking and drinking heavy. And thank God I don't drink. Thank God I hadn't drank in like 14 years. Hopefully my liver's nice and good, even though there was a time when I was backslidden and I drank too, all right? But here's the thing, is when we do these actions, they do have consequences, and we don't want that kind of stuff to happen to us. But it's not always because of some action that something bad happens to somebody. And obviously, in this picture, with these people who all got slaughtered by Pilate's crew that were there worshiping and stuff, uh, it, you know, doing their blood sacrifice for God, it wasn't because of them being any worse than anybody else, okay? And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be another picture here, too, just going to give us. And we can see that not all suffering is caused by someone's sin. Jesus did not identify these victims. Or he did identify them as sinners, though, okay? He calls them sinners. He says, were they greater sinners? You know, they weren't like no sinners. They were sinners. And we're all sinners too. If we think, well, that person's worse of a sinner than I am, then we're doing something bad right there. Okay? And I still think of this guy, okay? I see him on Facebook sometimes. He's in Florida. He was an Italian guy. And he told me once, and I think I told you this before, but man, it's like things like this sit on you sometimes as you're going through your life and you learn. He said, I don't talk too bad about other people. Because I don't want to spit in the air and see it come right back down on myself. And I thought, ooh, because we were all talking bad about other people. And that's why he said that. And then we all were like, hmm, you know? But here it is, is, is everybody's a sinner, okay? And indeed, there are greater sinners than other folks. But who's to judge with that? I think the right attitude is always to look at it. First Timothy 1.15, I am the greatest of all sinners. It's bad if we keep pointing and say, that guy is, that guy is. We should point at ourselves. We can't do anything about the other guy except make trouble with him when we do that. We can do something about ourselves when we point at ourselves as the greatest sinner because then we can reflect on that. We can go to God. We can pray for help. We can repent. We can ask forgiveness. And we can ask God to change us because we all need change, okay? And I tell you what, we are adverse against change, okay? As human beings, I study animals, okay? I study animals because I want to get the bad animals, okay? They want to kill my chickens all the time, right? So I, I study animals and I see a routine. Routine. Animals are very routine. If you learn the animal, you learn the routine. And it almost always goes the same way. It goes through the same hole in the fence. Crawls over the same top of the fence, okay? Comes at the same time of day, okay? Whatever it is, it's very routine. And us as human beings, as creatures as well... We're very routine as well. So it's very hard for us to get out of our routines, especially our sins, because we tend to 
gravitate toward these things that are so horrible for us and so bad for us. But, uh, but Jesus doesn't call them not sinners. He calls them sinners, okay? But he doesn't, and he also doesn't call them poor unfortunates. Oh, those poor people. Oh, those poor people. Why? Because what the sinners deserve, we deserve death. Every one of us deserves death. You know, I mean, if you, it, it's truly a, a right saying that if you were to say, somebody say, well, I didn't deserve this or something, and you should think in your mind, you know what, well, I deserve it, and I deserve far worse from my sins. Far, far worse from my sins. It's not good theology to say, I didn't deserve this. That's theology that shows you to have not really plumbed the depth of the sin in your life and the trouble and the hatred that you've had for God and the disobedience that you have and the troubles you have to say, I didn't deserve this. And truly, whatever God gives, God gives, okay? You think about Job, when it happened to Job that all ten of his children were killed that day by the devil because God allowed the devil, God even called on the devil to go do what the devil was going to go do. What did Job say? Shall I receive good and not evil from God? You know, he was, he, he didn't have this, whoa, whoa, is me. I, I can't believe this happened to me type of attitude. He wasn't a poor unfortunate. And neither are any of us poor unfortunates. And neither is anybody else in this world a poor unfortunate. Okay? Jesus says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now this word for perish isn't just like take your last breath and die. This is eternal punishment. If you've been following with us through the book of Luke, he's talking a lot about hell. He's talking about hell. And he's saying that he's taking this, that this, this example here, and he's got to a much deeper depth with it. That all those people go to hell, we don't know that. He's not pointing that out. He's pointing this out to the people who are listening in the conversation, in the context of what's been going on. And what we should ask instead of why is if we have a right relationship with God. So instead of saying, why did this happen to me? We should say, do I have a right relationship with God right here and right now? That's what we should be asking ourselves, okay? Humbly going before Him. Coming before Him for help, for mercy, for His grace. It's a bad picture to stand against God and try to shake the fist at God and say, I don't like what you did and I hate you and I'm going to stand against you forever with this. That, that won't do any good for you at all right there. That's like a little child in a tantrum tantrum, and he's not going to get anywhere with that. But thank God we still have a loving father that still loves his children, even when they do crazy things like this. But the right thing for us to do, the mature thing to do, is to ask ourselves, do I have a right relationship with God? And that's where these Pharisees and the people who were presenting this to Jesus should have been asking themselves, rather than trying to throw out about these Galileans and why did they all get killed like this by Pilate's crew, they should be asking themselves, do I have a right relationship with God? Because I tell you, most of the people Jesus is talking to in a rough way do not have a right relationship with God. Okay, they're, on, they're not on the side of the cross that's forgiven. They're on the side of the cross that's putting Jesus on the cross. So here we see when something bad happens, rather than leaving the conclusions about how guilty someone is, we have something far more important to think about. Our own sin and the punishment that it deserves. Okay, Every one of us should truly recognize that our sin deserves eternal hell. There's not a single person in here that doesn't deserve eternal hell. Okay, it's not the bad guys out there. It's not the 9-11 guys. It's not the guys that killed all those poor Russian folks yesterday or anything like this to deserve hell. It's us as well, too. They are not worse than us in God's eyes because all sin deserves hell. And we should think about this, okay? We shouldn't be jumping to conclusion, thinking, or even jumping to conclusion about the poor victims, thinking, oh, I bet they were really bad. And that's why God did it to them. And like I said, maybe some people will think that about the Russians yesterday, but I don't think that would be a proper conclusion at all for us to think about those Russians. Even Ukraine expressed their, their sadness about it, you know, that that's not something that was a horrible thing that went on, and they said they would never kill people like that. And I, I believe Ukraine's right. So far, I don't think we've seen Ukraine do some terrible, horrible, atrocious acts like this. Maybe Russia would do a horrible, atrocious act like this. It wouldn't surprise me. Over to Ukraine. But, they, but, I, but it didn't happen that way yesterday, okay? It happened to the Russians themselves there. But here, our own sin and the punishment it deserves is what we should think about. And earthly disasters ought to be eternal caution lights for us. When something horrible goes on in our life, 
let it be like a caution light. As if you're driving down the road and there's a big sign that says danger, road out ahead, you know, or danger, or men working, or, or some type of flashing sign, you know, that says something is dangerous out ahead. That's those things turning off. <laughs> Believe me, if I would have done my normal stuff this morning, they would have turned off in two minutes. <laughs> Turn it back out. But here, but here, but here we have to watch these eternal caution light signs in our lives. And there's things that happen in our lives sometimes that are so intense. There's something you're going to remember for all of your life. And it's better to remember these things, not forget these things, and look at them as an eternal caution light. An eternal caution light, okay? And like these guys all getting killed by the while they were trying to worship God, eternal caution lights would happen. And Jesus is going to bring on something else. It was like in the local news probably in those days, okay? Local news by word of mouth is how they did it. Or do you think that those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse offenders than all the men who live in Jerusalem? So at one point, somewhere over there, a tower fell down. Now there's all these speculations about the tower. I guess there was construction going on around the temple. There was different things. And uh, maybe somebody was tunneling or something. Seems like Jewish people tunnel a lot. I don't know to say this for sure. But I know in recent times there's tunnels with the Palestinians. I know there's tunnels underneath the Dome of the Rock, right, that they're complaining about. I don't know how, but there's a lot of tunneling going on. But, but that was some speculation all the way from back then, too, is what caused this tower to fall? But whatever that speculation was, the end result was a terrible result. Four, 18 poor folks just standing there got squished. We're dead. That quick, that quick, they were gone. You know, and just think about those 18 people. And there's still some people who think this way today. All right? Like Jesus said, think of the worst offenders. They assume that some are better and some are worse. And people generally get what they deserve in this life. Think about that. People generally get what they deserve in this life. I bet a whole lot of us might actually say that or think that pretty often, right? When we see something and we justify it in our mind, well, they get what they deserve, right? Remember what I told you about folks who smoke all their life and get COPD or some guy that drinks his whole life and gets a, gets a, a, a liver abscess and uh, all kinds of bad things that happens or different things. People get what they deserve, okay? That's, that's kind of a heartless type of thing, way to say something right there. Indeed, consequences do bring actions, okay? There are consequences to our actions and our sins, but it's hard for us as another human being to determine that on somebody else. Truly, our matter with somebody else should be a matter of love. Trying to love them, trying to share the truth with them, show some compassion, some empathy to them. All right? Our misfortune is the result of our misdeeds. Okay? That, that's what, uh, that's what, that's what, that's what uh, the truth of the matter really is. All of us are sinners. Why do all people die? Because we're all sinners. If anybody says, I'm not a sinner... They say, you're not going to die then, are you? Because the reason we die is because we're a sinner. Even though we're redeemed, we're born again, bought with the blood of the Lamb and forgiven, we're still a sinner and we're still going to die in this earth. There's not a single one of us in this room that's still going to be here in probably 100 years. Other than maybe Corbin. Maybe Corbin might be one of these guys that would be 120 or something. But, but most of us in 100 years from now... We'll be past, we'll be long gone, and no one will even think about it. Who knows what will exist on this plot of land, okay? Maybe the giant building will be here. Maybe there'll be a forest again, and there'll be trees right in the midst of where we are. We don't know, but, but we do know we're going to die. Every single one of us is going to die. And Jesus is pointing this out, and you know what Jesus' answer is? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So he says this twice. Twice for emphasis right here. And these are the three elements of true repentance. There's three elements. Confession. That means you can confess. You say, hey, I sinned. Contrition. That means you feel bad about your sin. You don't. You, you realize it's bad. It brings you sorrow. It makes you upset. It makes you sad that what you did. And change. Change is something that so many people seem to leave out. Okay. Change is part of repentance. We're supposed to change. Okay. Now you think about uh, Judas. Judas had the first two parts. He had confession, he had contrition, but he had no change. He went and hung himself right there. Which Judas, it says in the Bible, is the son of perdition. We know where Judas went. Judas went to the depths of hell. And, and Jesus said it would have been better if he had never even been born. Which means he's like way down there. He might be down there in a place where Satan is one day. 
But the Westminster Confession of Faith summarizes by saying that in repentance, a sinner, out of the sight and sense not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins, as contrary to his holy to the holy nature and righteous law of God, so grieves for and hates his sins as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. So this is what Westminster Confession says. We're holding on to the 1689 Confession. I need to do a little more digging and use 1689 stuff here, since that's what we're holding on to. But it's very similar to Westminster. But here, but here we see that, that even the guys in the old 1600s, when they were looking at what does the Bible say, what are we supposed to do with the law of God, okay? That's where these confessions came from. They came from things, so you ask a question, you have an answer, okay? You know, up until the Reformation, that didn't exist. The Catholics, they didn't get confessions until, like, the Baltimore Confession, and I think that was in the 1800s or something. It wasn't their style, but truly, it is the style of human beings to have a question and an answer, to have a teaching type of thing. Because otherwise, we all just assume everybody knows everything, and we don't, okay? We all got to know something right there. We all got to learn something. So that's where these confessions came from. And in that confession that they made in the 1600s, the Westminster one, they pointed out it should be confession, contrition, and change. And the word perish equals the eternal wrath of God when you do a, a word study on this word perish and how it's used in this context. And he was telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and did not find any. Okay, so once again, the fig tree. Fig tree comes up a lot. I wrote at the end here something interesting. The fig tree is the only tree mentioned in the garden of God for specifics. We know there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and there's a tree of life, but we don't know much about those trees. But there was a fig tree. We do know about the fig tree. Remember, what did they do to cover themselves up? They took leaves from the fig tree and covered up their, 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 their body parts because they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. So there was a fig tree in the Garden of Eden, okay? But something that we also see, and I didn't put all these verses up here, but there's a whole lot of verses. If you want the verses from me, let, let me know, and I'm going to give them to you later. But all the time the fig tree is used is usually talking about the destruction of the curse on the land curses. It talks about bad things when it talks about the fig tree. All right, this Fig tree isn't like something you want to idolize and, <laughs> and hold in a great place right there. When you read about in the Bible, it's constantly used in these type of illustrations about something very negative and destruction. Okay? And the warning is implicit. There may be a wideness of God's mercy, but there is a limit to God's patience. Okay? There's a limit. I tell you, what scares me even worse is I read the Bible all the time, and some people, the limit gets reached while they're still alive. There's no more chance for them anymore, okay? Now you see this in the Bible, and you're like, oh my, when the limit gets caught. You think about Pharaoh, first few times Pharaoh hardens his own heart. The last few times, God hardens his heart. Even at the, it even says, if you go back to Exodus, when they, when they were getting ready to run and the Red Sea opened up, it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would chase after him. God led the man to his death. God purposely killed Pharaoh. Pharaoh had no hope at all. When God's the one who hardened his heart and sent him the way he was going to go, there was no hope at all. And these kind of things to me are of the most terrifying nature. Because I don't want myself to ever run out God's patience. And I don't want to see anybody else ever run out God's patience. I want desperately for everybody I know, everybody I come in contact with, to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent, to believe, and to be saved, that they don't end up like the fig tree is going to end up right here. Okay? I want them to love Jesus and follow after him. But indeed, there is no doubt about it in the Bible. There is a limit to God's patience, okay? And we have to understand this. There's, there's warning signs, like I showed the big sign in the beginning, that says, that says, like, you know, warning, repent or perish. A big warning sign. Stop now. This is your last chance. And none of us know, none of us know if today is our last chance. I mean, how many of us, as you get older, you get a little pain, you think, oh, what is that? What is that? Is that my heart? Is that my heart? And I bet you, from what I see in the hospital, it might be your heart. Because about everybody that goes in the hospital gets their heart checked, they end up getting these stints and stuff put in their heart. 
You know, it's like a, a straw, from my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, but it's like shoving a straw up inside your artery so your artery stays open so the blood can continue to go. And some people get like four or five of them at a time, and some people my age get stints in their, in their hearts and things like this. So we see this, and we have to hold on to, to this last chance mm. type of ideology, the last chance type of living as we live every day of our life, and especially as it concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't hold on that today could be our last chance, that could be it for us right now. And think about those people in the theater. They probably all had a bunch of money in Russia, right? Because Russia, to me, it sounds like it's a pretty, they have troubles. You know, it sounds like it's not a place. It sounds like a place with a bunch of peasants, and they're doing the best they can. And, and it's not so great, you know, right? I mean, it sounds horrible to me from my picture of what Russia sounds like. I never got to go to the Red City. Probably now I never will get to go to the Red City or I'll be sitting in some prison cell or something as, uh, as, uh, as some kind of deal maker or something. If you want Buck back, you can give us 100 of our guys back, right? I don't know if they'd say that much. Maybe they'd say five of their guys or two. Maybe they'd say just say one. I don't know. But, but the thing is, the thing is, is, is those poor folks sitting in that theater probably never saw it coming yesterday. When those ISIS folks came in, they never saw it coming. It just went. It hit them. And their life was over. And some of those people who are wounded will never, ever be the same again. If you see some military folks walking around, sometimes, whenever I see somebody missing a leg, I think they must have lost it in the war. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes people lose legs other ways, too. But I think, man, how hard is that that the guy doesn't have a leg no more? How hard is that to go through life with these kind of things? It's not easy, okay? And I haven't experienced it myself, so I can't even tell you how not easy it is. But I can look at it and think about it and sympathize, empathize with these folks. It's some tough stuff. But the hardest thing is, is that one day, eternal life is coming, and it's going to hit us fast, and it's going to hit us hard. And the deal is, is did we take our last chance? Did we repent and believe? Because Jesus two times in here says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And that's eternal gone from him. So what is the answer? To repent. And uh, and like I said, we should not think we're all, that we are all bad. Don't think we're all bad, but not as bad as some. That's bad theology for us to think that. And let me tell you how easy it is. It's easy for me to think that all the time. Well, I know I'm bad, but not as bad as that guy is. All the time I catch myself. That's pride. Let me tell you, that devil of pride is always trying to get at me. All the time, I constantly have to humble myself, humble myself. And I tell you, that's the right way to go, to stay in that struggle and humble. And anybody says, I'm totally humble, I have no issue with pride. Oh man, you got a whole lot of issues with pride. We all got issues with pride. we got to recognize it, okay? And he said to the vineyard keeper, okay, so this is Jesus telling the story about the fig tree with no fruit. Behold, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? All right? So this is what he tells the vineyard keeper. Three years he's been looking, and there's no fruit. Cut it down. Why does he use up the ground? So this isn't some uh, brand new fig tree. This is a seasoned fig tree. I read in there it takes three to five years for a fig tree to really root and give fruit. So who knows? It may have been older than three years right here, this fig tree. But three years he's been looking for fruit from it. Maybe it was all six years already. And it was wasting space. I got a yard where there's water that comes through the street and goes through my yard and goes in the other person's yard. But I kind of have a flat yard, so sometimes it'll kind of sit in my yard. So there's a lot of places I've found in my yard it's not good to plant a tree because it's always watery and it'll kill the tree. So I only have a few good spots, even though I have a lot of yard, where I can plant a tree that's really going to do well. And I need to make sure that space is not being wasted. And think about if I was truly making money out of my trees, I would really be getting rid of trees that are not wasting space. And if you think about it, it's kind of a derogatory term. I hear people say it, but a oxygenarian, is that the right term? Have you guys heard this? Is oxygenarian is a term that's a negative term, but some people use about other people, and it's saying they're just wasting oxygen. They're wasting oxygen in this world. All they do is they just breathe. They're just an oxygenarian. I hope nobody ever uses this term about me, okay? I don't want to use it about anybody else, but I'm familiar with the term and I heard it. But the thing is, is I don't want to waste any space in God's story either. You think about this. All of life, picture this, is the story of the living God. And we get to be a part in the story. 
We're like a tree in the story. You think about Psalm chapter 1, it even calls the righteous a tree. And it's a tree that's planted by a, a water, like a river that thrives and does well and produces fruit. That's a Christian in the tree of God's story. The trees that are not in God's story, like these fig trees, we keep seeing how bad Jesus is, the fig trees as it goes through, they get dried up, they get burned up, they get thrown out in the trash. Think about the vine, and Jesus says, all those who are in me in the vine, and the vine that doesn't bear anything, I'm just going to bust it off and toss it into the fire right there. If you think about this picture, we don't want to be wasting space in God's story, in God's timeline. Make the most of your day today. The way you can make the most of your day today, every day, is to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow after him, okay? But this is what he says to this. He says, what is it? Wasting ground. Now listen to this. This is kind of like Jesus answering the Father, I think, is what it's meant to be like. And he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in manure. Man, I read a lot of stuff and I was looking to read somebody would talk, focus in on manure, but they didn't. But I know one thing, living in Ohio and being in other places, sometimes when you drive by some farmlands and they got the fresh manure down, they're like, oh, roll up the windows, turn off the uh, outside ventilation in the car. Man, does that stink. And I always think, I think about the farmers having to use that stuff. Imagine coming in at the end of the day just reeking of that smell. Probably washing it off yourself. I mean, probably... They probably really are good at not touching their hands to their mouth. You know, like we say, we don't want to spread germs, and we're all being careful since COVID time. They're probably really good about that, okay? These manure-type farmers, all right? But what is the manure good for? It's needed for the stuff to grow. And think about our lives. Think about manure and all the horrible, terrible stuff that can happen in your life. It's needed for us to grow. You think about stuff like that. Rather than saying, why me? Why me? Say, why not me? God, what are you trying to teach me? Help me, Lord. Help me and be with me. Give me strength, Lord, to move forward and to keep getting through these things right here. But we see that it's a mercy from, from this in this vineyard for the worker to tell the master to say, let it alone another year. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to try to put some manure around it. I'm going to do what I can to make this tree good. And you can think about yourself. How many second chances has God given you in this life? How many? I can't count how many second chances I've had in this life. I could write a book, and it would be a long book, and it would go forever and ever if I thought about how many second chances God has given me in this life. And all I can do is say, thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, and help me to be what you want me to be today. Today. Not tomorrow, not another day, but today. John Bunyan, well, you know who he is, right? God wrote Pilgrim's Progress, okay? Great man, great man. I wish I could have met the man back in history. He identified Jesus as the vine dresser in the parable. So he wrote about this subject too, this passage. He is cultivating us for repentance, preparing us for salvation. Treating the passage somewhat allegorically, Bunyan imagined him saying to the owner, I will loosen his roots. I will dig up the earth. I will lay his roots bare and hand and my hand shall be upon him by sickness, by disappointments, and by cross-providence. Talk about that, huh? That kills health, wealth, prosperity teaching, doesn't it? Bunyan was no health, wealth, prosperity guy. Imagine this. He's saying, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with this sinner, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him sick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him disappointments. And cross-providences, that was like... like horrible type of stuff. That was the sign of the torture. That was like the death chamber type thing. And these are some of the life experiences that God uses to bring us to repentance. Sickness, sadness, trouble. Jesus does this so that we'll be more, so we will bear more spiritual fruit in keeping with our repentance. Okay, you go back to Luke to see the same picture. And, and they, just think about this. It's, that's the kind of stuff that makes us the most beautiful Christians that we could possibly be. All the evil, all the trouble, all the horrible, all these things that we're praying about all the time in our prayer book for God to help us. God is helping us through this stuff too. He's helping us to bear more fruit, to be more godly, to love Him more, to be more dependent upon Him, and to grow, okay? It's like that song. I couldn't find a good version of it that went along on a good clip, or I would have played it today with my own music selection from John Newton, the guy that wrote Amazing Grace. And I asked the Lord that I might grow. But oh, the things the Lord did to me. He did horrible things to me is what he basically says in there.
but truly it was God helping him grow. Okay? And we even see this picture, put manure in there. And I'm like, oh. All right, the last verse. And it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Think about that. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the Father about you as a human being. If it doesn't bear fruit next year, fine. Then cut it down. All right? There comes a time at the end of the patience of God for every single one of us, and we need to be aware of this, okay? God cultivated Israel to be a fruitful tree in his vineyard. Thus, he had every right to expect them to bear good fruit. They had every spiritual advantage. The word of God in scripture, the promises of the covenant, the sacrifices of the atonement. Now they were in the presence of the Messiah. Therefore, they should bear the abundant fruit of obedience to God. Think about us. You guys are all in church today. This is beautiful and wonderful. And you're hearing the word preached. And you have Bibles. Every one of you have a Bible. You have a Bible? I've got a lot of Bibles in here. Unfortunately, you've got to have reading glasses for most of them if you're over 5-0, okay? But I have a lot. I'll give you one. But the thing is, is, is we have all of these wonderful things from God. We live in America where there's a church across the street. There's a church down the street. There's a church right here. There's a church down there. There's churches all over. All right? We have the gospel. We have television. We have radio. We have Moody Bible. We got RefNet. We got so much stuff out there to feed us and to give us. So much stuff to make us grow. Okay? And yet, what are we doing with it right there? We are blessed. We are so blessed in our country to be where we are right here, right now, today, and especially with the good news of the gospel, what are we doing with the good news of the gospel? And I have two boring slides, and that's it. All right? And the first one says, have you repented in the biblical way? Okay? Let's think about biblical confession. Is confession is the intellectual aspect of repentance. We know in our minds that we have sinned. Contrition is the emotional aspect of repentance. All right? That means you're real sad about what you've done. We feel in our hearts we've sinned. Change is the volitional aspect of repentance. All right? We resolve in our wills that we will go and sin no more. That's so important that we decide and we do that and we go. Okay? Too many times it seems like people preach repentance in some type of uh, wishy-washy way and they don't talk about change. Change is part of repentance. Without change, there's no, there's no proof. Think about this. If the person doesn't change, no fruit's going to come. No different things can come in their life. Be sure to repent of all your sin and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. Philip Henry wisely said, Some people do not like to hear much of repentance, but I think it is so necessary that if I should die in the pulpit, I should desire to die preaching repentance. And if I should die out of the pulpit, I should desire to die practicing it. Isn't that beautiful? It's so beautiful I had to put it in there. As a preacher, I hope if all of a sudden I have a sudden heart attack up here, I'm talking about repenting and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ to everybody right here. All right? And I pray that if I die somewhere else, that I'm dying living a godly life and practicing the life that God has called me to live and being obedient. And I wrote at the top, Jesus had, met the, Jesus had made the way of escape just as clear. Do you think the Galileans would have gone to the temple if they had known that soldiers were coming to kill them? Or that people would have gone up to the Tower of Siloam that day if they had known that it was going to fall. Unlike them, we know that a day of disaster is coming. How merciful is to tell for Jesus to tell us this. How gracious God is to provide a way of escape. Because it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Life. We have this truth. It's the most known scripture across everywhere all over the place. And yet, how many people have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? It's so sad. We have the warning. Those other guys didn't have the warning. The Russians yesterday, I'm sure they had no warning that ISIS was going to do what they were going to do. At least the poor people who were sitting there, they had no idea. The people that were in the towers on 9-11, they had no idea that day the planes would come flying out of nowhere and crash into them right there. Okay? We have a warning. What will we do with our warning today? Surely God expects the same thing from us. We have heard the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. We can read the entire Bible and both of its testaments. We have received the Holy Spirit who is working in us to produce love, joy, peace, and all other virtues of His grace. We are connected to Jesus Christ, the true living vine, 
Therefore, we ought to bear good fruit for God. We should be growing in godliness, gaining spiritual ground in our struggle against sin. Every one of us should be in a struggle against sin. All right? We should live in the struggle right there, right now. We should be active in ministry, doing something for the service of God. We should be affected in evangelism, giving a good testimony of what it means to have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We should have a life-giving spiritual influence on other people. We are called to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And I think this example right here, this is where we should be. This is how we should live. Just like this paragraph says right here. This is us bearing fruit. This is us being being what we need to be, productive. And my question to you, or it's the last question, is how fruitful are you? Are you bearing the good fruit of spiritual growth, faithful service, and influential discipleship? Are you as fruitful as you ought to be, or are you spiritually scrawny? I don't want to be spiritually scrawny. None of us do, okay? I, I think about uh, my man... Arnold Schwarzenegger. I like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't like that he doesn't have faith. I read some recently. He has no faith. But he, his testimony, he was a little guy getting beat up and picked on all the time. And look what he did. He's like the epitome of the muscle man, okay? At least in our time. Even as an older man, when you see his movies, he still looks pretty big and strong to me, okay? And he didn't want to be scrawny, and we shouldn't want to be spiritually scrawny. I actually wouldn't mind being a little scrawny in the middle side here, okay? I need to work on that. All right, a little scrawny there, but I, I hated it when I was in the army, and I always thought, man, I hope they don't call me this. The guys we'd all be working all the time, and they'd be like, look at that guy with toothpick arms. And I'd be like, oh, man. <laughs> they don't want to call me toothpick arms, you know. But think about this. Even more importantly than how we look with our bodies and stuff, how are we spiritually? You know, I heard something wonderful today is our man, Mike Gentile, our deacon man here, he wants to do something for the church of an outreach. And he doesn't know what it is yet, but he's going to figure it out. That's awesome right there. A guy that's strong, he doesn't do that kind of stuff. You know, he's, he's looking at some weights to lift, something strong to do, you know. This is really good. We should be doing some more stuff. A group of people, all right? He's the one that told me about it right here, right? But I think this, this is good. This is so good, and this is where we should be. This picture here of bearing fruit in our lives and not being somebody that if somebody met you, they couldn't even tell if you're a believer or not. That's that, To me, that one of the biggest insults I could ever have is they say, oh my gosh, I didn't even know you were a Christian. Oh my, but that hits you if somebody tells you that. It's nice that you just made a connection with another Christian, but you ought to think, shame on me, so shame on me, that they didn't even know I was a believer. I want everybody to know I'm a believer. I have no shame in it. And I don't want them to know it to like puff up myself or put pride on myself. I want them to know it because I'm called to live an obedient life to Christ that's contrary to the way of the world. And if I'm not doing that, then you're never going to be able to tell that I'm a Christian. But if I am doing that, you will be able to tell. Okay? And I'm not doing it that somebody can all call me Christian and whatnot. You know, in fact, people, if you're really living the Christian life, People are going to give you a harder time in life. Things are going to be harder for you, not easier for you. Amen. But I'd much rather bear that hardness for the Lord and take that joy than I am ascribed as one of His own, even by the lost folks around me. And that's what I hope and I pray. But with this, I'm going to close.